Okay, welcome to a rather unusual tape. We've pretty much finished up with the contact notes now, if you're doing these in order at any rate. This is a rather unusual tape in that it deals specifically with the information surrounding the life of Emmanuel, the man known as Jesus Christ. Repeatedly in uh, many different areas of the contact notes, this subject came up, uh, as well as even years before the contact notes, when Billy was having his uh, early contacts with Ascot from the Dow universe when he was a teenager. He also had some experiences surrounding the life of Jesus Christ. So I thought I would put all the information into one uh, one tape so you could hear about it all the way through at one time. This way it will make a little bit more sense instead of just getting pieces of things here and there. I'd like just for a moment to kind of <clears throat> challenge your imagination here. And I'd like for you to pretend just for a moment that you're living on a different planet. Let's say on your planet, uh, it's very normal, the society that you were born into, that you're very highly evolved. And in your schools, you have exact knowledge of how the universe was created, how life is uh, procreated, uh, the purpose and meaning of life. Uh, you have space travel. You visit other worlds. You're telepathic. Your memory is superb. You can recall from your subconscious almost any thought you've had your entire life. Uh, you are evolved to the point where your lifespan is 5,000 years. Uh, you have perfect health. Uh, you live in perfect harmony with all the people on your planet. Sounds like a pretty good place, huh? Well, the reason I ask you to imagine this is I want you to kind of get yourself in the state of mind that, um, where you live on a planet where there is exact knowledge and that there is real truth and that you live with a race of people that have now explored the universe uh, that we live in and have exact knowledges about what's really going on with the universe, with creation, and what life is all about. And this, of course, leads to harmony among people because there's no arguing and so forth among one another because the truths are all really known. You've evolved to that point. Now let's say you go to uh, a school on that planet and you decide to take up uh, planetary engineering and you go through all these classes and you learn all about other life forms and you're very excited about the prospect about uh, working with uh, groups of your own people and going out and seeing other societies on other planets and learning how they're going to grow and watching the races that are not very developed uh, discover fire and learn how to talk and how to build a hut to uh, you know uh, protect themselves with and how to find food and how to plant crops and how to establish governments and communities. You want to go watch other races develop. Well, let's say that you fly off to one of them. It's your first assignment, and you get to a planet that's uh, somewhat developed. You look down, and these people, uh, well, they're quite developed. They've uh, they have industry. Uh, they're able to uh, understand the periodic chart of elements. Uh, you know, they have communications. They have, uh, you know, education on their world. They know quite a few things. They're building communities, cities, and transportation, and so forth. And you look down, my, they're pretty developed. Let me see what I can do, uh, you know, to possibly study and learn more about this race. Well, you get closer, and you find out that it's a planet divided by some 200 different uh, what they call countries. And each one of these countries has their own ideas about what life is like and how to govern their people and uh, how to run their economic system and their barter system. And you find out that practically none of them agree. Not only do they not agree, but you find out suddenly that they're all fighting and arguing. They will even go to the point of killing one another and lying to one another. And then you get very interested. You think, hmm, fascinating. These are brand new concepts. And you find yourself uh, not even understanding the emotions of these people. As you listen into their thoughts and feelings, and as you start to watch their reactions to stimuli in their environment, you're perplexed. You weren't quite ready for this in the classroom. Because these kind of feelings, emotions, hate, anger, jealousy, and prejudice, and all this excitement and so forth, doesn't exist on your world. Your world is very calm. Your world is very in balance. Your world exists in sort of a meditative bliss because you've evolved beyond these things. You now approach life with certainty, with truth, and an entirely different attitude than the people on this world are doing. So you have much to learn. And you suddenly notice within the hearts and minds of these people as you start listening that they're not filled with the same comfort, bliss uh, that's on your world. Instead, it's a very difficult, hard life for the people on this planet. They're having a very difficult time getting along. 
and then it dawns on you, well, everybody on this planet seems to have a different idea about life, and they're all arguing and fighting and killing one another, and most of it's because they really don't have any real knowledge about the universe and what life is really all about. The meaning of life escapes these people. And they don't live in harmony with one another, with their planet. And oh my gosh, they're very close technically to coming out here into the free space. What's going to happen to them when they come out into the free space and suddenly find themselves face to face with all these other races, these higher evolved races, who have all these great technologies and all of this knowledge? Well, it could be a short ending for the people on this planet. We better do something to help them out. Most importantly, let's help them out so they can find peace within themselves. So they can start living uh, as a brotherhood of love and sharing and really discover the wonderful things uh, and the wonderful type of life you can have when you live peacefully in harmony with one another, within creation, and with nature that you live with. Well, you've got your task set out for you, don't you? So you begin to examine this planet to try to find out, well, where can you start? You know, what can you do to kind of help? Well, let's see. We have a couple of hundred different countries. Each one's got a leader. Each one's got a different idea on how to do things. Uh, maybe you could just call all the leaders. No, nah, that's probably not going to work out. They don't listen to one another now. Besides, I'm not allowed to interfere directly with the religious or power structures of a planet. We can't let ourselves be known. This because this starts impinging on these people's right to follow their own path of evolution. It's very important, as we know in our world, to allow everyone their own freedom of will, to allow them to learn on their own. They learn nothing if we do it for them. Hmm, difficult. Well, maybe we could uh, just let some of them know. Well, how would we pick the ones that we would uh, choose? How would we choose some of them? Maybe some of them are more intelligent than others. Let's examine more closely. So we spend some time examining different groups of people around the planet and find them, for the most part, just like we knew from class back at home, they're born pretty much with a, a pretty good sense of spirituality. It's when they come into the world, they're bombarded by all these unusual ideas, prejudices, and uh, belief structures and so forth that really throw them off track and prevent them from really living in harmony with one another. Hmm. Okay, we can't take too large of a group. Well, let's see. Maybe we could just leave some information for them. How would we do that? We could leave it in a book, or uh, maybe we could just take over their communication system and broadcast all this information to them in their sleep or something. Uh, that might not work too good. Could uh, establish fear or whatever if they thought suddenly that they were hearing voices from beyond. They probably wouldn't understand what it was. Well, I've got an idea. Let's try on this planet. Let's select one of these people at a very early age. Let's get them before they've been tainted by uh, all of the uh, deceit and lies that goes on on their planet. And let's educate them when they're very young. So it might be similar to how they would grow up on our own world, where we really have factual knowledge about life and creation. Let's pick someone who's pretty evolved. Let's find one of them that's older than the rest, that uh, has the potential for learning and understanding. And let's educate him from the very beginning for several years. And we'll give him lots of knowledges and experiences. And maybe we'll take him with us off the planet and let him see for himself other things around the universe. We'll take him to other worlds and let him discover for himself the truth about things. Ah, oh, I've got a good idea. We have great tech, uh, techniques. Let's actually move him back in his own history so he can really see for himself the real facts about how his civilization has come about and got to the point that they're at. Then he really will have understanding. He'll know more than anyone else on his planet uh, because he'll have real truths. And he'll know more than anyone else about what's real planet uh, because he'll have real truths. And he'll know more than anyone else about what's really happened in their world because I can see their history books are a mess. They've been rewritten on different parts of the world just to serve the interests of certain groups and all for just to control one another. That's what we'll do. We'll pick one. Let's find one. Well, we scan our instruments and find uh, that all around the planet there are a number of people who have strong potential, but we want to get someone right uh, when they're very young. Very young, let's find one when they're first being born. As a matter of fact, let's find a spirit in the fine matter world. We know how to do that. Let's find a spirit in the fine matter world, and let's intercede with them just as they're being born. So we're involved with their growth from the very beginning. That's it. 
So we do that. We scan the fine matter world, which is what many people are thinking is heaven or the other side. It's that place where spirits rest when they're not in physical body. We know all about that on our world. As a matter of fact, it's quite easy for us to dial in, in the equipment on our uh, ship right here, and let's find one. Ah, here's one. Let's bring him right in. Let's cause him to be born. He's about ready anyway. And we'll follow him right through his young years, and we'll educate him as to everything that he needs to know so that he can help the others. Ah, that's a good idea. That way he can inspire them, and perhaps some of them will listen. Maybe it'll wake up a few of them, because truth has a way of being very forceful. It's very strong. One man with the truth can stand up in a crowd of angry people and speak the truth, and slowly that truth will find its way to the others. People will turn to the truth. It will make sense to them, and they will come for the truth. This is going to work. I'm excited about this program. How about you? <laughs> okay. Well, I painted this scenario because I think this is pretty much probably what the ETs have done with Billy Meyer. And this is pretty much what Ascot was doing when Billy was only 16. Um, Billy had been caused to be born by a Pleiadian man named Spath. Uh, he procreated his birth so he would be born at a certain time. He uh, taught him telepathically all during his young years. He had several contacts with him when he was young, so Billy knew what was going on and what his life would be like. In other words, Billy's life went just like this. His education from extraterrestrials started right at birth. Okay, and at the age of 16, his education process was taken over by Ascot, an extraterrestrial from a very advanced planet, probably very similar to the one that we just imagined. She then took on the education of Billy, because Billy was now 16 years old and capable of understanding more and more, and she took him on several travels off the world, on the world, into different time frames, most importantly, so Billy would have his own truce. It's one thing to tell somebody something, and maybe it makes sense to them. But in order for it to become part of themselves, it has to become their own truth, which, needs, which, which means they need to experience it and make it part of themselves. So that's what they did with Billy. Ascot took Billy to many different time frames so he would have his own education, so his truths would become so strong within himself that he would have immense strength to carry on his mission as a prophet and to stand up against all of his enemies who would speak out against him. Okay, as we learned earlier in some of the tapes, Ascot did just that, and that she on several occasions took Billy uh, on trips in the past. They went once to uh, remember uh, to meet the uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Gicelli. They went into old Egypt to learn about that history and about the Bafath, which caused so many problems here. And on one particular occasion, she's taking Billy uh, to Jordan. And from here, I need to quit calling him Billy because throughout this time period, he was still known as Edward. It wouldn't be se for several years after that uh, that he would get, pick up the uh, nickname of Billy. So I'll try to remember to call him Edward as <clears throat> much as possible. If I forget, just substitute Edward every place I say Billy. We are now in the year 1956. Ascot has taken Billy uh, on a ride with her in her ship, and they are in Jordan. Billy's been there before, once before with her, where the, uh, they spent several days educating him all about his mission and the most unusual life that lay before him, and he learned a lot of the things about himself, as well as he was greatly educated in a lot of other matters about the universe, life, and the future that would serve him well. Interestingly enough, when they were in Jordan and they were walking, they came across a rather unusual individual named Jitchi. Now, Jitchi was a traveler, a kind of a guy on the road, and Jitchi was a, uh, about 59 years old. He was a Russian, and he had left Russia and taken off on his own and was just traveling with his pots and pans and experiencing the world and carrying his Bible with him. He was a Bible-carrying, God-fearing man. Well, they had a couple of conversations with Jitchi, and um, told them that uh, they'd probably see Jitchi again, which, uh, to their surprise, they actually did. Uh, they returned two days later to Jordan and uh, to uh, continue their contacts, because what they're going to do, uh, Ascot has brought Billy, at the age of 19 now, to Jordan in the current time period of 1956, because they're going to return back to the year 32 in that same location. 
And for some reason, she brought him to Jordan, and they're talking there and discussing about his, uh, his future life and his past life and so forth. And Jitshi comes and uh, surprises them uh, at the ship. They weren't expecting to see Jitshi uh, at that point, but there he was. So uh, Jitshi comes along with them, and uh, I should give you a little background. Uh, we went over this on another tape, so I'll run through it kind of quickly. Uh, Jitshi was a very religious type of person and had a lot of trouble understanding that this lady Ascot could be from another world and was not an angel sent by God. Uh, so after they got over that hump, uh, it was decided that it might be a good idea for Jitshi to come along, and he was extended the opportunity to come with him if he would chose to do so. And there were some discussions, of course. Jitshi told them that uh, he was God-fearing and believed in the Bible and all of this, and they had to have a few conversations with Jitshi before they left to explain that one ask it was not an angel, she did not come behalf on any god, and she was not here to change the world or anything, and that Edward was uh, undergoing, you might say, uh, history lessons, and that the purpose of this mission was to educate him, and that uh, Edward had already uh, put out much effort over his uh, short lifetime so far to educate himself very well in matters of spirit and so forth, so he would be ready for this particular journey that he was getting ready to take. Well, as I mentioned on the other tape, Jitshi goes with him. They do make a few other time jumps through history uh, and kind of get up to speed, so to speak, so they'd be ready for this one. It's no secret that probably nothing has had more impact on our society on this planet the last 2,000 years than Christianity, i.e. the story of Jesus Christ. And no matter where you go on the planet, you can get yourself into a darn good discussion with anyone when you bring up the subject of religion. Because depending on where you were born and how you were raised, uh, people from all different parts of the world all have a little different viewpoint. The majority of the world does not believe in Christianity. Just simple numbers, most of the people are either Islamic or Buddhist. Not that many of them are Christian. Now, we live here in America where predominantly this is a Christian society. When you're born into this world, that's what you are told is true. Uh, there's no reason for us not to believe it. This is what our parents and everyone tells us, but there really is no proofs provided, and we are not an open-minded society, at least we haven't been too much in the past, that allows you the re freedom uh, to actually learn about all the other religions. One of the problems is our education system. This country was founded on the principle of a religious freedom. We do have freedom of speech, and fortunately in this country you can go seek out this knowledge. But uh, you don't have too many options when you're a little kid. You're just taken by the hand and taken to whatever church or synagogue or center that your parents belong to. And for most of us grow up, uh, at least for most of our younger years, we grow up just believing what our parents have told us because we don't get a chance to get educated in anything else. Well, here we have a chance. Uh, Billy's been, uh, his educational life has been more controlled by higher beings, so he's on a little different path of learning. But Jitchi. His life has gone pretty much the way the rest of us have. Myself, I grew up in a religious family. My mother was a, uh, a director of an Episcopal church and is very active in it. I have a brother who's a minister and another brother who graduated from Oral Roberts. So there's a, there are a few Bibles laying around my house. And myself, well, I was an acolyte and I grew up through the church and there was a time I probably had the entire communion book memorized. So uh, I have a little background in that myself. Jitshi was probably similar to that and was having a very difficult time now understanding uh, what's going on and that how history could have got changed and altered so much. You can imagine what might happen to someone's mind when suddenly they find out most of the things that they know and they've been told are a little different. They're different and they've been changed on purpose. So that one might irritate you to find out that you've been misled, that things have been misrepresented all of your life, and you were educated wrong. Well, they take off for the year 32. They get into Ascot's ship. Ascot, they're in Jordan now in 1956. The ship just pulls away from Earth. And as Edward described it, they pulled off the planet. You could see the planet very small down below. Ascot does something with the instrumentation, and they immediately kind of race right back into the planet and land pretty much in the same place that they were, except it's no longer the year 1956. It's the year 32. Now, I know the calendars are off, and when we talk of the year 32 here, we're talking about the age of Emmanuel or Jesus Christ. From now on, we're going to call him Emmanuel because that was his real name.
In the old language, it was spelled J-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. Not so with an I or an E, but with a J. So we'll refer to him from now on as Emmanuel. Okay? They are now in what we're going to call the year 32, and it's just a few days before the crucifixion. They arrive there, and they get outside of the ship, and the first thing that Edward notices, though he's looking around to see how much different everything looked, because they landed right back in the same spot. They're just a couple thousand years earlier. Well, he notices that the vegetation's quite a bit different. Uh, trees are different. Some of the hills, the slopes and angles on them are a little bit different. But for the most part, he's able to recognize the landscape, and he can tell right away that he's at the same spot that they just left. Uh, Jitshi right away jumps out of the ship and grabs his pots and pans and his bag and everything with him and his Bible because he's having a very difficult time understanding all this. It's quite a shock to your system to be 59 years old and to have all of your well-placed logic suddenly being shattered. Well, uh, Askett explains that they're going to have to change their clothes because they're going to be here for four days and they're going to do some traveling on foot and they're going to go to different places and they're going to mingle among the locals and uh, it's going to be necessary for them to wear these language uh, translators around their belt and she has some robes for them uh, which look like the uh, typical robes of the time uh, you know, clothes were quite simple then. People didn't have haircuts too much, and they just, in most cases, just wore some sort of robe. And they had that as well. She had, and it isn't explained why, but she also asked them to take off their earthly clothes and put on the clothes that she brought for them from her planet. And these were uh, silvery kind of looking uh, suits of some sort of soft material. They had to put these on, and then they put the robes over top of that. And Edward was quite concerned. He was almost chuckling. Gee, I hope nobody pulls his robe off of me and sees me glowing like this silver thing here. So it doesn't explain why they need to wear that, but it might have something to do as far as protection, but they don't really go into that. They have language translators so they can understand the language of the day, which I believe was Aramaic. Uh, that's what the old... I don't know if Aramaic was something they wrote or spoke. I'm not sure about that. So they proceed, and uh, they leave the ship. Askett explains that they're going to be on the road now for four days, and they take off uh, on the road. Well, Jitchi's still as mumbling as they go down the road. He's got his uh, Bible with him, and he's getting very nervous because he already knows what's lying ahead. But actually, they're going to speak to Emmanuel that he, after all these years of his life, he never considered the possibility that he might actually come face to face with and actually speak to and talk to Emmanuel. Uh, I mean, he is so glorified in our time, we've so exaggerated and blown out of proportion who he really was, that now we liken him to a god. Uh, some religions like to call him the creator of the universe, the creator of all men, and there's just no limit to some of the exaggerations, when in fact he was a human being like the rest of us. So Gypsy's having a very difficult time, and already the arguments as they go down the road are kind of breaking out, and Edward's trying to calm him down, and so is Askin. And just she remarks a silly statement like, he can't wait to see this guy, Emmanuel, he's going to wring his neck. Because he's kind of upset that uh, he's finding out historically that things aren't really the way that we've been told. And Edward is defending Emmanuel and says, well, I don't think that's really quite the right attitude to take here, Gypsy, because it's not his fault. Emmanuel's living in a time where there's also a lot of ignorance. And I believe him to be a very intelligent, worthwhile human being and probably very loving. And it's not his fault for all the things that have happened down the years and all the exaggerations. So you need to lighten up here a little bit. And Jitchi calms down just a little bit. Well, they wind up uh, right outside of Jerusalem. And uh, Billy says it, does, it looks quite a bit different than it uh, did in 1956. There's a wall, he says, around it. He doesn't say if it's all the way around or just part of it. And they're at the Mount of Olives. And off in a distance, he can see some little huts that are called Bethpage. And there's some men walking down their way. And Askett remarks that, yes, this would surely be uh, Emmanuel and his followers that are coming. And poor Jitchi is just starting to get all heated up again. He's getting very nervous, and all this is entirely too much for him. And he's starting to get very excited. And Edward turns to Askett, and he says, um, uh, let me see if I can recognize which person it might be. And Jitchi's jumping in front of them and starting to curse and yell how they can do this to him, and he's so excited. And Edward starts to try to calm him down, says, quit cursing and get a hold of yourself. 
Try to realize what a great moment this is, that in any minute now you're about to have probably the greatest moment of your life, and look what you're doing to yourself. You know, calm down and relax, but Jitsi can't do it. Askett remarks that, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, Edward remarks as he looks in the crowd, and he thinks he picks, he picks out the one that's probably Emmanuel. He says, that surely must be Emmanuel, and uh, Askett agrees with him. Yes, that's him. And... Um, Emmanuel pulls away from the crowd of people that he's walking with and motions to him for him to sit down beside the road, which they do, and he starts walking towards uh, the three of them. Well, all this is proving entirely too much for Jitchi, and he's screaming and cursing, and uh, Edward just hops, uh, turns around and pops him right on the nose. Well, it's probably kind of an hysterical sight. Here's this great historic moment. Uh, can you imagine actually being able to go back in time and, and talk to Emmanuel and you've got this guy with you? But I, I can feel sorry for poor Jitshi. It must have been a very uh, difficult thing for him. The outcome of it is nice. Jitshi calms down and apologizes just as Emmanuel walks up and says, Be greeted in peace. And he calls Edward by name and he acknowledges Ascot. And uh, he motions for Jitshi just to go to the side of the road and sit down with his friends and followers there that they'd be happy to take care of him. And he turns to Edward and says, you hit him very hard. And uh, Edward starts to comment and he says, that's no reproach at all. I just, uh, he had it coming. I could tell that he was uh, out of control as I was walking towards. And he says, but it's you I wish to speak to. And uh, so they, they immediately pull over and just sit down the side of the road there. We've got Ascot, Edward, and Emmanuel. We're having a little chat. So um, Billy was kind of, excuse me, Edward was curious how he knew his name. And Emmanuel says, well, it's um, really quite simple. He says, I did not learn this from Ascot, and I have not talk, talked to her before. Actually, I have the ability, I guess you would call it a future vision. I have the ability of prophecy, I have the ability to look into the future, and you, Edward, I know much about your visitation was expected. Um, and he can tell already that Edward has a lot of knowledge and so forth and compliments him on his education so far. And Edward says, yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. And they start throwing a few flowers at each other, and there's a few comments there about, you know, how, uh, uh, how advanced each of them are, actually are. And Edward comments that Emmanuel is standing before a heavy examination coming up also, and which he is. He's only a couple of days away from uh, what we call the crucifixion. And uh, Emmanuel speaks, yes, life demands very many difficult things. We all have to walk our way and in honor. And he turns to, uh, he says to Edward right away, he says, I can already perceive your questions, and I know the things that you want to ask, so it will be not necessary for you to speak them, and since we do not have much time, let me go straight to the answers to your questions that you're thinking. To begin with, the lessons that I speak and so forth are not new. They're not even new to describe my time. These things that I speak of, the laws of creation, the real truths of the universe, have been known to others down through our times. They have been passed on. Here they are only falsified for the scribes themselves. They would wrongly place God above creation and pretend that it is their own God who is the creator of all things. This is simply not true. For myself, I've been educated and know uh, that God being a human being just like all others, but that the God, the great God, uh, is truly a king of wisdom. Creation is not a human form, but a creational spiritual energy which creates all things in the universe, including the different gods. He says it's very difficult to speak the truth here in these times because it's very difficult for people to face the truth. As before me, there's been very little truth spoken on, on my world. Most people just don't want to hear it. There are so many different viewpoints uh, on this planet right now. It's very difficult for Emmanuel. He says, in the future, the world is heading for very much misery because of all the lies of the scribes, and I'm very well of all of the problems in the next 2,000 years that will be caused uh, by the religions. They will stop at nothing. Murder, deceit, fear, intimidation, whatever they need to do to control the masses of the people. Emmanuel goes on to say, I know the truth, and I'm well aware that the truth brings with it great wisdom and force of spirit. As well, I will be able to f fulfill his mission. He says, the truth is far more important than any pain that might be temporarily passing through the body. It's possible to torture someone, even destroy them, but the truth will live on. It is impossible to actually kill the truth. 
He says, I also know that even though I am a human being, it will be said that I am equal to the creation, that after my time is gone, that those will write about me and make all sorts of claims and exaggerations about me. As a human being, though, I will also suffer the fate of the bodily death, and it says in 83 years in Billy's notes. Now, 83, if you add that on, he's supposed to be about 32, that would be up to about 115. So, uh, and it does mention in the notes in certain places that it is believed he did live to be about 110 to 115 years old. He says, my body will be very old, but my spirit will be unbroken. The coming events that are about to happen will make me a martyr. There will be a lot of bodily pains, but they will scatter like the winds by the force of my spirit. This is the way it must be so I can fulfill my mission and continue on to India. Edward also notices as he's speaking and he comments, he says, excuse me for interrupting, but I notice that you seem not just a little weary, but you seem to have a little grief, and I pull these feelings from you. And Emmanuel's a little surprised. He says, yes, I, I do. I, I grieve for this world with all of its problems, and I grieve for these people who have so little understanding and live such difficult lives and so forth. And he goes on a little bit about how the world affects him and how he is so sensitive to the sorrows of man. And then he remembers that Edward's 2,000 years of advance of these other people that he's used to talking to. He's not used to discussing these type of things uh, with someone, you know, of this type of evolution. So he apologizes to Edward and uh, says, yes, it's refreshing to speak to someone uh, uh, a little bit more evolved. So Emmanuel is also aware, and he seems to be able to almost read uh, Edward's thoughts quite simply. He says, I'm aware of the things that you know and the teachings that have already been passed on to you. You also have very great knowledges. He says, the first words of the New Testament will be written down around 200 years past uh, his death, or assumed death, on the cross. Now here it gives us a clue. Uh, to when Christianity was actually formed. Uh, later on in the Talmud of Emmanuel on the other side we'll find out that it was really the year 189 when Christianity was actually formed. Edward wants to know if any of his teachings are being written down. He says, I'm well aware that you travel and you speak and you teach uh, what you can, but are these things being written down anywhere so that they might be preserved for the future? Because the New Testament, as it exists today, there are many errors in it, there are many exaggerations. Emmanuel comments that, well, my scribe and faithful friend Judas Iscariot uh, writes down most of my important lessons, but try to remember that very few people read and write at this time. Judas can read and write, I myself can read and write, as it was necessary for me to learn during my own years of education when I was young. But he says, I really don't have too much time for it, and frankly, most people can't read it. Besides, uh, I'm well aware of the problems that are coming up. Uh, even in your time, people are not mature enough, and it's going to take more than two decades uh, before the grain of truth will actually find some soil, he says. A scripture has been stolen from the bag of Judas Iscariot, he tells Edward, by the son of a Pharisee named Judah Iherith, which is similar sounding. He's plotting to sell these writings of Judas Iscariot to the Pharisees for 70 silvers so that they can accuse him of blasphemy. They want to be able to say that even the followers of Emmanuel betray him and turn against him. How possibly could these lessons be true? He says, my friend Judas uh, will be told that later there will be time to actually write down, write down all of my lessons in correct manner, and these will be preserved for another time sometime in the future. Well, Edward is surprised that Emmanuel already knows about Judith, Judah Iherith and the misconception about his friend Judas Iscariot. He says, yes, I'm well aware of this. Uh, and he says, it's uh, not anything that I can really do about because it's happening right now as we speak. It is meant to be. And he comments to Edward, he says, your life will be much the same. It's going to be very difficult. And one of the things you must learn as a prophet of your time is to allow events of the future to happen the way they must happen. There is always the tendency to want to intervene and to change future events, but man has to walk his own path, man has to learn his own lessons from his mistakes. And it's important that prophets, all prophets, learn how to control themselves. This is why most prophets already know all of their own future in advance so they can deal with it much better. He says it will not be Judas Iscariot, 
that actually is hung, and he's not my betrayer, but it will be the really Judah I harrieth who will hang himself by the tree in the potter's field. Edward had some questions about his own life and wanted to know if Emmanuel was really familiar with what may be happening to him because Edward's only 19 at this point and is not known at all in the public and has not come forth really with any of this information about uh, all of his extraterrestrial contacts or the things that he's been you know, open to and learned about. So Emmanuel says, oh yes, your future is known to me as well. As a matter of fact, he says to him that uh, it is prophesied in 2,000 years that a great prophet will once again bring my truth uh, to the world. This is you, Edward. And uh, Edward is kind of shocked by this uh, because there have been references to his uh, life of difficulties and his great life and his mission as a prophet. And uh, now that mission is taking on a much heavier meaning as well he finds out that uh, the prophecies of Emmanuel are also involving him. He says, in your time, people will also think you are crazy. They won't believe the things that you say you have done and the things that you talk about. You'll be accused of being a liar and worse. He says, but you, have, but you have learned much of the truth, and this grows inside of you very strong, and this will give you the strength to stand up against your enemies. It will provide the strength, your personal knowledge, of you know that you are right, this will give you the ability to speak the truth very strongly, very harshly, and bring the wisdom of creation to mankind. But this meeting that we're having right now, and he tells Edward, he says, uh, uh, in the future you will write down all about this, and this, this meeting will become public knowledge. You will tell people about this. They'll think it's fantastic. No one will actually believe you even then. <clears throat> So don't expect people to rush up to you and uh, <clears throat> praise you for what you've done. You'll be regarded as a maniac. He says, your worst enemies are going to be the cult religions of your time. In my time, they're very dangerous. Uh, your time is quite a bit different, uh, he says, because they're very organized and they're very powerful. And <clears throat> even though the writings that Judas Iscariot will write down, uh, uh, those writings will find their way into your time. And the words of truth, as you bring them out into society, says they are not, of course, going to be uh, favorably met. That the religions then, for almost 2,000 years, have been having their own way with their own truth, and they're used to the control and power, of course, that um, the power, of course, that, um, that that brings them. So there's going to be great difficulty on Edward's part when he brings his truth forward. Emmanuel also comments to Edward that he can expect many attempts on his life. Edward hadn't thought too much about this, but uh, Emmanuel's informing him that the life of a prophet can be very dangerous, that many people and organizations will stop at nothing to keep the truth from coming to mankind, including murder. You have only to think with the inquisitions uh, brought on by the Pope and the Holy Chairs. Uh, over nine million people in Europe were killed simply because they disagreed with the church. Those are 9 million people that are recorded. Many people think that could be as high as 18 million. It might be as twice as many people. But here we have, we know historically, factually, that the church put to death millions of people just because they disagreed, disagreed with them. Another question came up. Edward wanted to know how Emmanuel felt about this name, Jesus Christ. Because uh, ask him if he's aware that in future times he will be regarded as Jesus Christ, the Savior and the, the Lord over all of creation. Emmanuel comments that as of this time as we are speaking, this is the first time I've heard that name mentioned. Until this time I've never been called that, nor have I heard that. He says this will happen later by one called Paul, who is my enemy. And for those of you who been to your Bible school, you know that at the time a man named Saul, S-A-U-L, had approached Emmanuel. Emmanuel recognized him for the evil enemy that he would be. Saul would later be called Paul, and it will be Paul who will write down Emmanuel's lessons, almost taking credit for himself, but uh, it will be he actually that forms the basis for Christianity but by writing his interpretation of what uh, uh, Emmanuel's teachings were all about. He actually will establish Christianity, and Emmanuel calls it kind of a Paulism. 
He says that uh, it's unfortunate that most of my original writings at that time will not be used to form Christianity, but uh, unfortunately Paul will write it all down, and that will be used as the basis to form Christianity. And Paul is slightly confused uh, at the time that he will write those. Right now he's my deadly enemy. But he says, overall, I feel very badly that I will be remembered and will be called Jesus Christ and will not be remembered as being Emmanuel, being the human being that I am. I'm very well aware that they will make a God out of me, that they will change my name. Most people will even be surprised to know that my real name is Emmanuel. They won't know that I never lived as Jesus Christ. Also, very interestingly enough, it will be sad because the words Jesus Christ are really negative phrases. Uh, Christ means the anointed one in Greek, and it refers back to a cultish organization uh, which demanded blood deaths and so forth. And he says, when you say some words, people of your time will not even be aware that sounds have effect on your subconscious, which affects your spirit and can control your moods. That the word Christ in Christus uh, form negative meanings to the subconscious. So it is not even a good word to be calling him. It means to destroy the truth. And the reference, which we talked about in uh, some of the tapes before, there is reference to this number 666, which means destruction of the truth, and these words, uh, Christ being one of them. So he's very unhappy about that. Actually, he says he's just rather sad that uh, things will get altered and that it's unfortunate that he will not be remembered for being the human being that he is. Another thing that came up was about his birth date. Edward wanted to know if he was really born on December 25th and what we've heard about him being born in Bethlehem and all these things were true. Emmanuel says, yes, I was born in Bethlehem. I was not the son of God, and never in my time have I ever said that. I don't claim to be the son of a God. I know full well who my father was. He was one of the celestial sons not, uh, known as Gabriel, and he was a physical man. My birthday, my birth date was not December 25th, but February 3rd. He says there have been mistakes in history. Uh, there, apparently when we went on the Gregorian calendar, we slipped like 35 days or something. And I think that's what he was making reference to. But his true birth date was actually February 3rd. So he's a Waterman guy. Well, Edward has another question, and he's intrigued by this idea of these scripts that uh, Judas Iscariot is going to write at a later time. And he wants to know how he could uh, get a hold of them when he gets back to his own time because, of course, the, any original notes directly from Emmanuel we do not have in our time. We only have the New Testament, which is supposedly based on uh, Matthew and Mark and uh, these Gospels, and actually it's based on the writings of Paul. Well, Emmanuel says, yes, the, uh, later on my mission will continue on into India, and I will live in Srinagar, India, and towards the end of my life, Judas Iscariot will live to be 90 years old, and before the end of his life, he will write down all of my teachings and writings. And uh, my son, I will have a son, my first son's name will be Joseph. And uh, Joseph will take the writings of Judas, as well the story of my life, and he will bury it somewhere, uh, so it will stand the test of time and it will be found in your time, but this is not for you to do. As it turns out, it wasn't because uh, the scripts are written, the scrolls were written in Aramaic, which Billy wouldn't be able to translate anyway, and it was deemed, uh, in the future, it was decided that someone else would be doing that. As well, Emmanuel knew at that time who that would be, and uh, he even mentions to Edward that uh, this will happen in your year of 1963, that these uh, scriptures written... They're written in hand, actually, by Judas. Emmanuel does not write them himself. They are written down by Judas Iscariot, and they will be discovered at that time. But he says, I will inform you where they will be, and you will know all about them. There's a discussion, then, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Edward is learning a lot of different things, and among them he's learning mathematically and numerically how to calculate things like the evolution of a being. He's been intrigued where in the ships, an Ascot ship, they are able to look at the life of an individual on the screen and see their evolution, their birth time, uh, their death time, and so forth by these high technologies. And she has also been teaching, and Billy has learned, excuse me, Edward, Edward has learned in India about how you can do this uh, through with numbers to ascertain the evolution of an individual. 
So there's a discussion which goes on for about 10 minutes between Emmanuel and Edward where they are discussing how they both do it, and uh, they're working there to find out the actual evolution of, of either one of them. As it turns out, uh, Emmanuel uh, has many capabilities that Billy does not have. As we know, and Emmanuel reiterated, that his main abilities are future vision, future sight, uh, as well as the ability to heal. He has specific knowledges, and he's been well trained in these areas, how to get into the aura of another individual and be what's called a spirit healer. Billy does not have these same abilities. Uh, so his, uh, but on the other hand, the reason I bring that up is their evolution seems to be about the same. And by evolution, we're not talking about just knowledge, because Emmanuel clearly seems to have the greater knowledge, at least at, at this point in his life, uh, because his experiences and his knowledges uh, seem to outweigh those of Edward. So uh, even though Edward is learning a lot from Ascot, but they do calculate out that both of them are over 2,000 years in advance of their time. Obviously, Emmanuel is, and we really haven't advanced too much as a society in the last 2,000 years. I mean, we have, you know, better technology, we live better, the quality of our life is better, but I don't know that we've advanced too much spiritually. Uh, probably a little bit, but we certainly haven't advanced 2,000 years spiritually. Uh, so I, I think it would be really kind of a surprise to all of us if we could go back to those times and talk to the people back then and listen to the kind of stuff that's in their head. But the, you can do that here on our own world. If you go out and discuss at different places in the world the concepts of belief and religion and so forth and spirituality with people, you're going to be amazed at the ideas and attitudes that some people have. I, I have personally I've visited many different areas of this planet and it, it amazes me, some of the concepts and the stuff that is in people's head uh, about how they conceive life. Well, I can see we're running out of tape, uh, but not things to talk about, so I'll see you on the other side. Okay, we're back on the other side here, and we were just finishing up with uh, Edward's trip back to the year 32 to talk to Emmanuel, and they were discussing when we left there the difference in evolutions in the two people. Um, Emmanuel was very con uh, aware of Edward and knew that he, uh, his evolution was very, very high. Actually, his age of evolution apparently was higher than Emmanuel's, that uh, uh, Edward was not actually an earth being, that his spirit had come from another planet and benefited from more lifetimes, greater knowledge, more experience. It's not mentioned in there where the origin of Emmanuel is. There are constant references throughout the contact notes of the connection between Emmanuel and Edward. Uh, Billy, uh, later in life, on conversations I've had with him, there's some confusion on Billy's part, too. There were constant references that he may have been Emmanuel, that he was somehow connected with Emmanuel. Uh, it's quite obvious that he actually is the prophet who is bringing back the teachings of Emmanuel that Emmanuel prophesied about. This is already happening here in the year 32, and Billy is the prophet that is spoken about. So, but they both ascertain that they understand each other's numbering system and that they are both uh, living far in advance of the evolution of their current times, making it very difficult to talk to the people of their time. That goes without saying. They also had one other little chat about um, uh, Billy just one, excuse me, Edward asking one more time about this idea of being the Savior and the Son of God. And uh, Emmanuel says, yes, I, I sense your meaning there. And I wanted to make it very clear, he says, that never have I said in my lifetime that I am the Savior for anyone. It is not that that I teach. I'm not teaching people that I'm here to save them. I'm teaching people to try to be responsible for themselves by living with the laws of creation, by observing nature and understanding it. I'm trying to teach them to stand up and develop their own spirit, to learn happiness through the force of their own spirit to become peaceful with one another by development of spirit so hate and anger and these things just disappear but they don't quite get it he says never have I either said I was the son of a god I've tried to explain to them that I was educated by the sons of God 
that I spent 40 days in the home, in the palace of God, understanding that I've been able to be taught by the celestial sons from the Pleiades. He knew this. And he says, I've explained to people over and over again that even though I talk about the words and the laws of God and of creation, that I know full well that my father was the angel Gabriel. He was a physical being. And that my mother Mary was my real mother and my Joseph is my stepfather. He says, I've tell, told people this, but they don't pay attention. They continually want to you know, raise me up higher than I actually am. The things that he performs, the healing and so forth, which we're going to talk more about in a minute, uh, have so astonished people. Uh, it is so advanced for their time and our time also that people can just not help themselves that, that to believe that he is some sort of God. But he wanted to reiterate that never had he mentioned this, that he is fully aware that God's uh, that there are many gods, and that the God, the great God of the three races of the human earth, who started the three races on uh, earth, is a human being, but one that is just greatly more educated, a king of wisdom. And as we learned earlier, the Pleiadians call these people Ishwishes, when they are on the very edge of all knowledge of the physical and spiritual life. So he kind of cleared that up, and uh, in the Talmud Emmanuel, which we're going to move into next, that's described even more in detail, because these writings that uh, Emmanuel is talking about, uh, that will be dug up in 1963, which I'm going to begin to explain in a moment, are put into a book form and called the Talmud Emmanuel. Well, the contact is about ready to end. They've talked for quite a while, and... Uh, uh, Emmanuel is wishing Edward Luck in his, uh, in his teachings to gather strength of his spirit so he can fulfill his missions. And he makes one other comment that he says, you know, uh, we don't want to get misled about religion. Religion has many good qualities, and we owe much thanks to religion for preserving as much of the teaching and stories of my life as they have. Because, and even Edward agrees with this, that uh, religions on their own are not wicked intrigues. They are not bad. There is much good in religions. It is simply the misuse of them which is, mis uh, which is misleading to people and which is so harmful to people. Those people which take the goodness of religion exaggerate it and bend it around. I know for myself, and being raised in an Episcopal family, that there are a lot of very loving, beautiful people uh, who believe in Christianity, who are very devout in their uh, beliefs. And these are wonderful people. And the people, the priests, for the most part, in most all of the churches, are the same. They believe full well. They are full of love. They are wonderful people trying to do something well for humanity. These people are not the problem. There are many people who exaggerate uh, and pretend that uh, Emmanuel is something that he's not. Hardly anyone knows the real truth about the real life of Emmanuel, and that's what the Talmud Emmanuel is going to bring to the public. But he just wanted to make it clear that he understands the differences, and he's not trying to make the statement that religion is bad. It is the misuse of it which is leading people astray. Uh, Edward has a comment about Ascot uh, not being included in the conversation, even though she's been sitting there all this while. And Emmanuel, uh, he seems to be very exacting, a very intelligent uh, person who is right on top of the thoughts of Edward all the time. And he remarks it was uh, that uh, the conversation was for you and I, and that Ascot full well knows all of the laws of creation and is more is aware of all the things that we're talking about. And it was it was my time to speak to you, and I'm sure that Ascot takes no reproach to that. And Ascot chimes in, of course. Uh, that's exactly why I was here. So with that, they get up, and Emmanuel says, follow me, and they walk over to the followers on the, they're sitting across the road where Jitchi now has had his chance to make a few friends and calm down, and uh, he's having a great time there himself, and he's not paying any attention to the others. So uh, Emmanuel and his followers move on down the road and go on, and uh, Jitchi, Ascot, and Edward then return back to Ascot's ship and return back to their own time frame. They do not stay there for the next coming of days, which, of course, are very important in the life of Emmanuel. Okay, this next part, we're going to go over the actual scrolls that were written by Judas Iscariot. Uh, we've heard in the uh, previous section here that how Judas Iscariot has written down much of Emmanuel's teachings during the time of his ministry, but uh, they've been stolen by Judah Iherith 
and used against them. And the other problem was, as Emmanuel pointed out, hardly anybody reads or writes in that time period anyway. So he was well aware of being a future visionist, Emmanuel, being able to see the future, that it would be important later on uh, as there was evolution in society and as people became clear in their thinking and were more open to the truth, there would be an opportunity to reiterate the truth to in the future and have it take a foothold in our society. And that's when we're living now. We are at that time. So as we will read in the Talmud Emmanuel, the papers, I mean, excuse me, the book that's going to be formed out of the scrolls that Judas Iscariot will write, what happens after the crucifixion is they will uh, continue on. Emmanuel will eventually wind up in India where he will live in Serenagar, which we're going to talk about. And um, Judas Iscariot will write down all of his lessons, and these will be buried in the ground. Well, in 1963, the Pleiadians led a Greek Orthodox minister named Rashid uh, <clears throat> to the spot where these scrolls were actually buried. Now, they were buried exactly in the original tomb of Emmanuel, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And they were underneath a rock, uh, and they were dug up by him. What happened was, once he dug them up, uh, they were in a kind of a glass resin sort of case. Uh, and it looks like the resin had almost been poured over them or something. And Rashid took those, and as I understand from other people, I believe that they were actually taken to the British Museum at one point. I believe that they were actually taken to the British Museum at one point to try to authenticate them. And uh, since they were in the old Aramaic language, this is strictly secondhand knowledge, and I don't know how accurate it is. But from what I understand, was they were not able to authenticate the scrolls as far as aging because they were in this resin box, which seemed to prevent them from aging. They were, however, quite curious about the box itself. Well, Rashid was chosen because of his uh, great knowledge of religion. Pleiadians then helped teach him Aramaic so he could begin to translate these scrolls into German. He worked on them very diligently, but uh, he himself was having many doubts as he began to read them and find out the truth about uh, the original teachings of Emmanuel and how things had actually been altered, even his name, and much of the teachings themselves were quite altered. So um, he had a few doubts on his own, but he was able to continue uh, actually translating all this stuff into German. And he contacted uh, Edward Meyer and uh, let him know that he was doing that. And Edward actually met him in India, and on three different occasions they went out to the grave site in India, where uh, Emmanuel was actually buried. Now, this is an unknown gravesite. It's uh, not uh, where people commonly think it is. It's out on the edge of town somewhere in the mountains on the side of a hill. And uh, both Rashid and Billy had been directed to there. Uh, Billy was most interested in going there because during his time when he was visiting uh, Emmanuel in the year 32, he was, of course, very curious, like anybody would be, what was really going on here. Uh, if he was really in the year 32, was this really happening? Was this some sort of mind control thing, or what was really happening? And he was challenging his own uh, consciousness as to how this could be possible. So he was told by Emmanuel that uh, when he would move to India and live there, he knew where his grave site would be, that he would leave something buried for Billy so that later on in his own time he could go there and dig it up and he'd know that he was not absolutely crazy. So uh, Billy did go to the grave site on three different occasions and dug deep down into the sand and so forth where the grave site was and uh, found, found what he was looking for, which turned out to be some sort of foil object that we mentioned earlier that... Um, at least let him know he wasn't crazy and that had been left there by Emmanuel for him, you know, like 1900 years before then. So these scrolls, uh, which were not at that site in Serenagar, they were back in Jerusalem at the original site where Emmanuel uh, was supposedly buried for his three days after the crucifixion. That's where the scrolls were at. They were placed there, uh, which we'll go over again later, by Emmanuel's first son who also was named Joseph. So the scrolls were dug up, they were translated, and they, contain, they contained the teachings and story, the life story of Emmanuel, completely through his ministry, up through the crucifixion, and up till his time of death at 110 or something like, we don't know his exact age, he was over 110 years old. So it was the complete life story of Emmanuel. Well, what happened was, unfortunately, 
this minister was working on them. And as he was doing so, he began to get threatening uh, uh, letters and threatening calls from different extremist groups that heard that he had these scrolls and didn't want, did not want them exposed to the public. So they took off, and they, he and his family went into hiding. They were hiding out in Baghdad. And when they were in Baghdad, they were approached by some Jewish extremists who threatened his life and were trying to get the scroll, so he fled to a Lebanon refugee camp. And there, once again, he was attacked by Jewish extremists. They fled in the middle of the night. The Jewish extremists apparently broke into the house they were staying in, or this camp, whatever, and uh, machine-gunned the place and set it on fire. They got away, but unfortunately he lost some of the scrolls at that particular time. He escaped with his life, wrote Billy a letter, and uh, had transmitted Billy uh, some of the scrolls. Actually, all that he had left at that time was the first 36 chapters, of which apparently there was about 200 chapters altogether. So he, uh, excuse me, about 100 chapters. So he um, sent what he had, which is what we have today. Billy then got them translated uh, in uh, German, and they were later there was a translation in English for us to read. So what we have are the, uh, not the original writings of Emmanuel, but the original writings of Judas Iscariot, his, uh, his, uh, his scribe, talking all about the teachings of Emmanuel and his life story. Now, what's left of these scrolls is put into a book called the Talmud Emmanuel. And it deals with his life, as you'll see. I'm going to go over the book now for you and tell you what's in it. It will deal with his life up through the crucifixion and beyond as he moves into Damascus and then into India. Also, at the beginning of the book, there's a little forward there, an explanation by Billy all about uh, the book and how it came about and uh, the story of it which is pretty much what I just got through explaining. And there's also a picture of what Emmanuel looked in there, how he looked. Now, it's not exactly a picture, it's a drawing. He at one point had asked Semyasi if she could draw a picture of Emmanuel so he could put it in this book. And she was a little concerned. She said, well, why don't you draw it yourself? You're quite handy, and you know what he looks like. And he says, well, I don't have the talent for the drawing. Besides, it would be better if you did it. And so she agreed, and she drew a picture of what Emmanuel actually looked like. And that's in the very beginning of the book, so you get to see that. It's just a hand drawing done with, uh, like with pen, so you can see. And as you can see from this picture, that he doesn't really look anything like, you know, the usual pictures we see of a young, blonde, uh, you know, smiley, happy-looking face fellow. He doesn't look like that at all. Uh, Billy once told me that he's the same height I am, which is roughly about 5'11", 5'11 and a half. And uh, he weighed about 170 pounds, 175 pounds. He had a very heavy build, uh, broad shoulders, heavy hands like a farmer. He was a Jewish boy with dark curly hair. So he doesn't, and this is what the picture looks like, the drawing that Semyasi did. So he doesn't look exactly like the images that we're usually seeing uh, and so forth of him. Um, interesting to know when you see this picture, your thoughts will probably reflect to the, uh, uh, the Shroud of Turin. Uh, there are some kind, sometimes called the death shroud or the death cloth. And this is supposed to be the cloth that uh, Manuel was wrapped in after he was taken down uh, from the crucifixion cross. And it's supposed to contain the likeness of Emmanuel, and there's been arguments for years over its authenticity. Uh, Billy says that the drawing in the book should prove to you that it's not because it doesn't look anything like uh, the image that we generally see from the Shroud of Turin. At least says the Shroud of Turin is fake. It's not real. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's in the Talmud of Manuel. It's about 100 pages long, and uh, much of it is pretty much the Bible stories that you've heard and aren't too much different. But the beginning of it is certainly different because it explains uh, very well uh, from, a, uh, from Emmanuel's viewpoint who he was, who his father was, and how he got uh, his knowledge. And this is quite a bit different than uh, what you've been told in Bible school. So that's the main part I want to go over. I'll also tell you how you can get a copy of the book, because the book now is published in America. Uh, it's almost a secret, though. You'd have a lot of trouble finding it. But I'll tell you where you can get it, and I'll put the address down at the end for you here, so you can order that book if you'd like. Okay. I have a copy of the book here with me as I'm doing this because there's so many names and things in it and some of the areas of this book I want to quote to you exactly because I want to make sure I get them right. 
this isn't this is not a book on uh, just theory and philosophy that you just want to talk about. There's some really very interesting passages passageways in this book. To begin with, uh, when a book first starts out, it goes through the um, genealogical tree of Emmanuel, tracing him back to his origins, so you can see actually uh, where he actually came from. So, actually, I'm going to read you the first part right here so you can be very clear on this. This is the book and secret of Emmanuel, which means God with us, who is the son of Joseph, of Jacob, the distant descendant of David, whose lineage goes back to Adam, the father of man of the earth, who was created by Semyasa, ending with an A, the leader of the sons of heaven, who were the guardian angels of God, the great ruler of those who traveled from afar. So already here, we're having testimony here by Judas Iscariot that the uh, Emmanuel himself, uh, his origin then is becoming from the guardian angels of God, those who traveled from afar. Then it goes on to say, Simyasa, the heavenly sons and guardian angel of God, the great ruler of those who travel from far away through the space of the universe, created with an earth wife, Adam, the father of the wise, intelligent race. Well, we heard earlier in the contact notes also about Simyasa, how he created Adam, and then he created another woman, an Eva, and coupled them together and started this genealogical chain, which is going to end up with Emmanuel. Adam took an earth wife and created Seth. And then it shows in the book here, it shows you the entire tree. Seth created Enos. Enos created Akabil. It goes all the way through uh, down uh, 80 generations to the point where uh, Jacob created Joseph. Now, Joseph, of course, is the stepfather of Emmanuel because he was not the real parental father. Joseph uh, was the uh, spouse of Mary, the mother of Emmanuel, who became pregnant by a distant descendant of the son, Rachel, who was the guardian angel of the secret. It doesn't say much more about this. Rachel, he's not Emmanuel's father either. He somehow is the, uh, I guess he's the father of the father of the father of Emmanuel's father. At any rate, it goes on to explain here that actually um, Emmanuel's father was Gabriel a messenger who impregnated Mary, and he was one of the guardian angels of the sons of heaven. He was a Pleiadian, by the way. So it goes on to explain that, uh, and then it explains, of course, the story how this actually happened, that a guardian angel then comes to Joseph, who is uh, Gabriel, and explains how important it is uh, to Joseph that he actually marry Mary. Now, Joseph, of course, had found out that Mary was pregnant, and in those times, even as it would be now, that if you were uh, engaged to someone and she, she suddenly became pregnant by someone else, you'd have a few questions. And then uh, you probably would decide that could be caused, even cancel the, the wedding. And Joseph had thought those ways also. So Gabriel came to him and explained to him how important it was that Mary had been impregnated 11,000 years after Simyasa created Adam to fulfill the prophecy of God who spoke through the prophet, uh, I believe it's pronounced Jesaja, J-E-S-A-J-A. -A. Those of you who are into the history of this may know better than I. He prophesied that, Behold, a virgin will be impregnated by a son of heaven before she is married to a man before the people. By the way, you should know that uh, Mary herself, who uh, was Emmanuel's mother, was Illyrian by descent. God and his followers came from afar from the depths of the universe and created a new race with the early women of this earth. And that's exactly what really happened. So, and according to this book, it says, Honor of the man of earth is due God, for behold, he is the true originator of the white, wise generations of people on earth. You see, the gods, the celestial sons, were of Lyrian descent, who were a white race, uh, very blue-eyed, sometimes green-eyed uh, people and were the, you might say, the more beautiful looking people. And they created, when they intermingled with the then developing earth human beings here on earth who were brown skinned, they created their own white race here, which was far better looking and more evolved than the developing earth human beings who were not as old and were not nearly as developed. So this is what they're referring to. It also goes on to say that God reigns over the earth, the Lord of the celestial sons and men of this white race. 
Now bear in mind also that when the Pleiadians are talking about God, they're talking about there are many gods. God is a, a king of wisdom. He is an Ishwish. And there have been many gods on different planets. There is not just one god. They're referring to the god over the three developed human races here on earth. God is the lawgiver of this human race, and his wishes shall be obeyed. Mary became pregnant by the law of God. It was decreed that Emmanuel be born. Gabriel was chosen as the father. Mary was chosen as the mother. And so that what was filled was the law of God. So Joseph hears this, and he agrees to wed Mary. And we know about that at any rate. So, of course, they are, um, they are married. Uh, Mary is already impregnated, and by the way, it was not done with any magic, uh, possibly with some sort of artificial insemination, we don't know for sure, but it was either that or it was physical. At the time, Caesar Augustus decreed that a census of the world should be happening, well, we know about that, and that's what brought Joseph and Mary into Bethlehem, because that's where Joseph's origins were, that's where his family uh, came from, so he returned there to be counted. And the time they were there, apparently it was pretty busy in town, and uh, it was time for uh, Mary to have her baby, but there was no room at the inns. They couldn't find any room, so uh, they had to sleep in the straw, of course, outside, and Emmanuel was born in the straw. Well, at the time, Herod Antipodus, who is the governor, hears of the birth uh, from some wise men. Apparently what has happened, that there's a light in the sky, like a big tail of the comet, they call it, and uh, three wise men come all the way from the Orient. They hear voices from this light in the sky, and they are told that a great king of wisdom has been born, and they should follow this. They do. They come all the way from the Orient, and they appear before Herod Antipas, and um, explain that uh, they had followed this light in the sky, that they heard that a great and powerful new king had been born, which will bring great wisdom to the people. So they follow it. Herod was very frightened by this, as we read in our own Bible stories, and thought this new king might exercise some cruel power. He was probably rather concerned that it might throw him out of office. And he wanted to know where this newborn child was. Well, the three wise men told Herod, that he says, well, in Bethlehem, in the Jewish land, for it was written by the prophet Micah. And uh, so, at this point, they didn't know exactly where, but they were quite sure that it was going to be in Bethlehem because of this prophecy. Well, Herod asked the wise men to continue on to go to Bethlehem and see this young child and then let him know exactly where it was because he wanted to uh, follow up himself to adore this young child. Well, the three wise men then took off on their own and again they followed the light in the sky that led them to Bethlehem and where they found this new child, uh, Emmanuel, born there with Mary. And of course, the, uh, they brought their gifts, which we've all heard about, of gold, incense, and myrrh. Right after they had been there and given their gifts, again the light appeared in the sky, it says, and a voice from the sky told the three wise men not to return to Herod as he had planned uh, harm to the child. Well, the three wise men, uh, that was enough for them. So uh, instead of going back to Herod, they took a different path and went back to the Orient their own way, on a different way home. Gabriel then appeared to Joseph and told him to take the child and go to Egypt. Because of the problem with Herod, he didn't want the child harmed in any way. So he told Joseph, take the child to Egypt and I'll deal with Herod, and I will let you know when it's time to return. Uh, after a period of time, apparently Gabriel has uh, done whatever he did, sent a messenger to Herod or whatever, calmed Herod down, who then has a change of heart and pronounces that he is no longer... Uh, has any, I guess you call it a grudge, against this newborn child. And... Um, now that he understands that he is merely a king of wisdom. So Joseph and Mary return, they leave Egypt, and they return to Galilee, where they live in the city of Nazareth. And this then uh, fulfills the prophecy that says that the Nazarene shall be called Emmanuel, because now he lives back in the city of Nazareth. At a certain age, and I don't know what it is, uh, Emmanuel goes to John the Baptist, who at that time was preaching at the banks of the Jordan River. He was preaching according to the laws of God, the same that Emmanuel had learned. He was preaching that the creation was the holder of the secret of secrets, that God was the ruler of the human race, but also revered creation. The people from Jerusalem and Judea all over came to be baptized by John. He again thrashed out at the Pharisees and called them vipers and so forth, 
and was speaking strongly for the teachings of God. Emmanuel came to him, and when he did, uh, John was surprised and says, Well, I need to be baptized by you, for you are of greater wisdom than I. Emmanuel says, Let it happen now, for it is up to us to fulfill all justice, since we are both sons of the earth. So John baptized Emmanuel. Shortly right after that, as Emmanuel comes out of the river after he's been baptized, there's a bright light all overhead, light all overhead, and everyone falls to the ground. Out of this light, there's a great voice that says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He will be the King of truth, which shall lift this human race to knowledge. Well, Emmanuel rises and is immediately lifted up into this metallic light and ascends up into the sky. Emmanuel was not seen then for 40 days or 40 nights. He was taken by these guardian angels to a place, it says, between the winds of the north and the west to learn the secrets of wisdom. There he spent his days with the wise saints of God and the guardian angels. And let me just kind of refer to the old book here so I can get that part right. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what's called the secret of Emmanuel is what it says in the writings here. He goes to this place, which it sounds like would probably over in the area where Florida was, where the great gods and the celestial uh, angels actually lived. And there he learned the wisdom of God. He was met and introduced and educated by the guardian angels and the celestial sons. It says there he saw the forefathers, the saints of ancient times, who were the fathers of the human race, the celestial sons. And there he went north along the ends of the earth, where the metallic lights and fire vehicles fell out of the sky with singing covered with smoke and fire and soared into the sky. He saw great marvels at the end of the earth. There a large door of heaven opened up, and he saw the three races of mankind. As big as the area of the sea near, near the river Jordan did the heavenly doors radiate, it says. Radiating inside was the entire land of Israel, alive and true. Behind this other, the door was no hidden secret, for the Sohar entered the smallest spaces, it says, of the cottages and revealed the last to be known. Then it mentions behind the second gateway to the sky there were grand mountains whose tops reached into the sky and disappeared into the clouds. The third heavenly port revealed a land of huge dimensions, mountains with rivers, lakes, and oceans, because there lived another human race. As I've said before, the God of that time ruled over the three human races that had been developed, which we remember earlier were primarily the Hebrew race, uh, the Indians around the Black Sea, and then the uh, developing brown skin race, the Indians of, of the American continent. So there he stayed. He went into the palace of God, which ruled over these three human races, and uh, met the celestial sons. God himself, he says, was immortal and ancient, the size of a giant like the celestial sons. Um, in the palace of God, there appeared to Emmanuel two very tall men, the likes like he had never seen before. He said their faces radiated like the sun, their eyes seemed like burning torches. Fire came from their mouths. Their clothing resembled a layer of foam, it says, and their arms were like golden wings. So surely this is where the concept and idea of the angels came about. It says in here that they lived in their own world because this world had killed them. These two men from the seven sisters, the Pleiades, were sacred teachers, together with two smaller men who said that they were men from Bawi, B-A-A-W-I. And you'll remember from Billy's contact notes that the Bawi on some occasions uh, were aiding the Pleiadians even here on earth. So this is where Emmanuel got his education. During those 40 days and 40 nights, he was taught the laws of creation. He was taught the laws of God and to understand nature. And most importantly, he was given his great abilities of healing and future vision that would serve him throughout all of his life. And through the um, rest of the Talmud, it is not entirely different <clears throat> than the Bible stories we've read where he does healing and so forth. But in each story, you find constant reference to the laws of God. Nowhere in here uh, does Emmanuel ever talk about being the son of God. He always attributes his father as being Gabriel of the celestial sons. And at no point in here does he call himself Jesus Christ. It's never mentioned in the book. And at no point in here does he ever revere himself as a redeemer, a savior of any type. But the book it refers to his lessons, how he tried to teach people through parable, how to learn, how to think, how to develop truth for themselves. 
He spoke to them continually about the will of the Spirit, how to develop strong will through the laws of creation and the knowledge of Spirit. The stories of healing lepers and so forth are in here. Uh, in the house of Peter, where he uh, brings a woman back to life and so forth. The healing of the two possessed. He, uh, it's also in here all about the disciples. I've read this over several times. And again, it's fairly similar. Many of these stories to just as the Bible stories that you've read. It's a hundred pages long. And I don't wish to go through all of them right here. And I'll save you that for your own excitement when you can get a copy of the book, because I'm going to tell you where to get it here in just a moment. The other really fascinating part is when we get towards the end, when it explains all about the, uh, the crucifixion. And I, that part I know well, so let me tell you that part. Okay, we're going to move ahead to the Last Supper. And uh, where Emmanuel spoke to one of his disciples, and he tells him to go into the city to a certain person and tell them that I want to have the Last Supper with my disciples at his home, for behold, Easter is near. Which they do. They have the Last Supper. And, of course, the most importantly here is that this is where Emmanuel explains to the, uh, his disciples of the great heavy time that is on him, that he will be crucified and that he will be lying dead in this state uh, for three days and three nights, where again he shall rise uh, from the dead. And they have a toast. He says, all of you drink from this cup. Your throats are thirsty. Also on rainy and cold days, it says. They then, after the dinner, they go to Gethsemane, uh, which is the area where he's to be captured later that night. And that's a very difficult time for him. Uh, interesting reading in here, it talks about how now, even though he knows he must fulfill his mission, because it is written so, it's the will of God, as to not to mention there's going to be a great learning in this also for him. But uh, this is the part where he really breaks down, and you feel how human he really was, because he's about to face a terrible ordeal of bodily pain. And which will be inflicted by all of these wild, crazed people. And it does happen. So all of his disciples are bedding down, going to sleep, and he's waking Peter up, and he wakes Judas up. To He doesn't want to be alone because he knows of the terror that's about to happen to him, and he's trying to keep his strength together uh, to face up to what's about to happen. Well, it does happen. Uh, Judah I. Harriet comes. And uh, he has a, a group of men with him who come to take uh, Emmanuel away, which they do. And they take Emmanuel back into town, and he's presented before the high priest, who, of course, used the stolen uh, scriptures of Judas Iscariot to um, maintain that he's blasphemous and that he's gone against the uh, will of their God, and so he must be killed. So after the high council, uh, and the high priest, of course, you know, that was kind of a rigged deal, they... <laughs> They, they, they immediately are wanting to sentence him to death, but they can't just do that on their own, so they have to take him before Pontius Pilate, who is the governor. And like we've read in the Bible and our stories and so forth, Pontius Pilate really found no guilt in the man and actually begs Emmanuel to step forward and defend himself, which he does not do. So um, Pontius Pilate would actually kind of like to see him go free. And as is the custom on Easter, he always brings out two or three of the uh, prisoners to the open crowd and lets the crowd decide what the fate would be. Well, on this particular day, it says in here that the crowd was a little rigged, that the, uh, the members of the high priest and so forth had plants in the audience, and many people had been paid uh, gold and so forth to yell for the life of Emmanuel. And they did. They yelled, let him be crucified, let him be crucified. And no matter what Pontius Pilate could say to them, they insisted upon it. Well, Pontius Pilate washed his hands in front of all of them. He did not want to be responsible, he said, for, the, for this innocent man. Well, the crucifixion went just as we really had heard. He had been drug out to the crucifixion. Uh, Billy told me one of the things that's not commonly known, though, is that most of the bones in his body were already broken. He'd been beaten so much on the back that his uh, ribs, cage, and so forth was busted up very poorly. So he must have been in tremendous pain at that time. So he's put on the cross. And, of course, he's uh, you know, taunted and yelled at and so forth. If you're such a great uh, king of wisdom, whatever, why can't you get yourself off the cross? There's a tremendous storm which lasts for about three hours while he's still on the cross. Uh, and after that time, it looks like he's just... And after that time, it looks like he's just gone... Uh, he's almost dead. And it says in here that he's fallen into a coma. And Joseph of Arimathea, who is a follower of Emmanuel, is watching. 
in recognizing that he has fallen into a coma. At that point, a soldier steps up and it says here, puts a knife into his loins, not into his upper chest where it's commonly thought, but he pierces his loins to see if Emmanuel was dead. And it says here that a blood mixture uh, with some water came in it, which generally insinuates that a person is either half dead or dead altogether. And they were kind of surprised because it was unusual the people that uh, were crucified who died so quickly, even though Emmanuel was nailed to the cross, where it was the custom normally to tie people to the cross. Okay, well, um, after that, after the uh, soldier had done that, uh, man, uh, Joseph immediately runs into town to Pilate to get uh, the permission to take the body down, which he does. He takes the body down, Emmanuel's body, and he takes it to a family crypt and puts the body inside. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting part was it says in here that there's like a secret entrance to this. Guards are placed in front because the high priest are worried of his prophecy of returning after three days if someone may steal the body and claim that he still lives. So they put guards out in front, and the guards and Mary and Mary Magdalene are out in front of this tomb, while Joseph and uh, three uh, friends of Emmanuel's from India have access to this tomb through a secret entrance somewhere in the back. So they treat him, get him back into health. It's even suggested that his father comes to help out, and Emmanuel sneaks out the back. There is, at that point, there is a white light in the sky, and uh, Emmanuel's father, Gabriel, comes down and uh, puts asleep the two guards in front with some sort of light device and pulls the rock back to show everybody that he has risen. And he tells Mary then to go into uh, uh, town and tell everybody that he's gone. He says, don't be, she, and he tells her not to be afraid and so forth. But of course, how could she not really be? Well, at that point, uh, what happens is Emmanuel appears another time or two for his disciples, and he has to, uh, as fate would have it, he has to do something with Saul, who has been his biggest enemy up to this point. And after Emmanuel has gone and he goes on to Damascus, Saul then begins to create terrible problems in going around and uh, uh, trying to stamp out all of Emmanuel's work and uh, is having people, anybody who uh, uh, still talks about Emmanuel, he's trying to have them arrested and so forth. So Emmanuel does something about this. And on the road to Damascus, he waits for Saul, who's coming along the road. And by benefit of some friends of his of India, who give him some powder and so forth, he creates an explosion on the road of smoke. And then a voice booms out to Saul, and Saul is very afraid. He says, who's there? Who's there? What's going on? And he says, I am Emmanuel, whom you persecuted in your hatred, as you do my disciples. Get up and go into the city and let them teach you according to how you are supposed to live. Well, Saul is, uh, uh, he's, of course, very shook up by this. He thinks that it's the, uh, the uh, reincarnation or resurrection, because Saul believed in resurrection, not reincarnation. So Saul, of course, then uh, goes into Damascus. He's taught by the disciples of Emmanuel, but he doesn't get it quite right, and this actually is the basis of Christianity. Saul, who is called Paul, then writes Christianity in his own words, and that's the foundation of Christianity. The Talmud doesn't stop there. It continues on to explain how uh, Emmanuel has been in Damascus now for two and a half years. He then calls for his mother, Mary, uh, his brother, and uh, for Judas to join him, which they do. And uh, it says, for a long period of time, uh, Billy had to keep kind of secret about this, but then he let the Talmud out. And it goes on to talk about how Emmanuel, at 45 years old, uh, he marries a young and pretty woman who has him numerous descendants. And as the uh, normal head of every family, he settles down and today is what is called Serenagar outside of Kashmir, India. There he made many journeys and kept preaching his teachings and so forth. At the age of about 110, between that and 115, he died a natural death and was buried in Serenagar. Uh, his mother Mary, by the way, uh, died when Emmanuel was 38, when they were on the road in Pakistan. And she's buried somewhere in West Pakistan, I have not been there, in a little town called Mari, M-A-R-I, and that's where she was buried. Um, Judas Iscariot died at about 90 and was buried at a place not far from Serenagar. Uh, the firstborn son of Emmanuel, uh, which he has several, is also called Joseph. He wrote down Emmanuel's story and added that to the uh, teachings of Judas Iscariot, which is what we've been reading. And he left India after his father's death. 
And after a three-year journey, he returned to the land where his father uh, and had lived and uh, died in Jerusalem, where his assumed death in Jerusalem was. And there he took the original scrolls he had from India, and he hid them in that tomb where Emmanuel had originally lain. He thought that would be the safest place, and uh, it was. That's where they stayed until 1963 when they were dug up. So Emmanuel did live on. Uh, he lived in Serenagar and uh, continued teaching there. Not only that, he ventured out on many occasions into other areas, trying to spread the word of his teachings. It's most um, he, from what I understand, his name at that point in India was called Yes Asif. I think he had several names at the time, but that's I believe the most common one. I didn't get that from Billy. I got that from another book called Jesus Lived in India which I went over with Billy and he agreed with that uh, Holger Kernstein, the, the man who had written the book, who uh, was very close on many things, and that apparently was Emmanuel's name during that time period. A couple other things. Well, one other thing anyway. I told you earlier that uh, I wanted to let you know where you could get a copy of this little book so you can read it. Um, as in any interesting document like this, of course, historically, this book is going to be challenged, and uh, many of us could read it, and if you're not more well-schooled in Christian histor history than I am, it would be very difficult for you to read this and try to authenticate it. But there are many people throughout uh, the land who are very knowledgeable in these areas, including an uh, author of a book called Celestial Teachings, James Deardorff. And uh, James Deardorff did write a book, and it's called Celestial Teachings, The Emergence of the True Testament of Emmanuel. Now, I, I uh, should let you know that uh, Professor Deerdorf, uh, he was a professor at Oregon State, and he spent six years examining uh, the Talmud Emmanuel when he got a hold of it and wrote this book called Celestial Teachings. The book itself is much longer than the Talmud is. The book itself is uh, 300 pages long. And what he has done is he has gone completely through the Talmud in every way, and being a Christian historian, uh, has tried to authenticate or reveal to fraud these writings. And overall, I can't go through the 300 pages and explain it to you, but his general assumption was, when he was done, that yes, this is the true testament of Emmanuel, and probably and quite possibly predates the, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. You can get this book called Celestial Teachings, and you can also get a copy of the Talmud Emmanuel, which is now published in English. Um, and you can get it from Wildflower Press. This uh, uh, information will also be in your exhibits there, but just so in case you lose those, I'll put it here on the tape for you. Wildflower Press is located at P.O. Box 230-893, Department C.T., as in Cat Thomas, in Tigard, Oregon, T.I., G A R D, and their zip code there is 97224. Now, at the time that we're making this tape, in 92 anyway, uh, let's see if we have some prices here. Okay, Celestial Teachings is 1795, the Talmud Emmanuel is 1595, it says here. And um, postage is a dollar for one item, so you can, uh, you can write to them and maybe get a current price or uh, send uh, that amount of money, and I'm sure they'd be welcome to, to send you a book. So, uh, And if you also got celestial teachings, it could answer an awful lot of questions for you that you may have as you read the Talmud as to its authenticity, and then you would have the work of a Christian historian who for six years went over this document to verify its validity. Okay, so ends our tape on the Talmud Emmanuel, so you can fast forward, and I'll see you on the next tape.